Thank you for joining my session. Welcome everyone. Uh, for those looking for a kilt wearing speaker, uh, hopefully at the next Cisco Live, you'll be able to catch me wearing my kilt on a Monday. But until then, welcome. This is uh, a session on my journey to cuddle with an API. It's a very interesting uh, title to a talk, one that is based in uh, an interesting debate going on in the Kubernetes community, specifically on how to pronounce its kubectl command, or is it kube control, or is it kube cuddle? In this talk, we're going with the cuddle. It just makes a cooler title. Um, with that, I am Tim Miller. I'm a technical solutions architect with Cisco, and I have been automating things for quite some time. Uh, but nowadays, I'm using all the cool tools like Terraform and Ansible, and I'm doing that with particularly in my day job, looking at network engineering and networking uh, architectures. Now, this is a short lightning style talk, so we're going to have a very brief agenda. We're going to talk about how I got here and talk about how I got through it and give you a quick little summary. But more importantly, uh, it's more important to think about the audience and who you are. So first and foremost, this is not a software development methodology talk, okay? Uh, this is all about uh, a message and a discussion with you, the network engineer or systems engineer, who've been fairly serious about automating, um, but when you had to like kind of veer off script, you had to build your own scripts and hit the APIs and so you've, dabbled in some Python, you've done some REST API coding, that sort of thing. And now, in my, as in my case, you're kind of at that point where you're thinking about taking on something a little bit more. So with that, let's kind of dive into how I got here. And that is, I'm going to start with a hierarchy of automation. So this is kind of gives you the structure the way things kind of build out in terms of automation. So usually your product or your service you're working with has a formal API that's kind of the table stakes today. And then on top of that, there are higher levels of abstraction uh, that you leverage in order to get to where as engineers we want to be. We want to be in this very low code, no code kind of area of automation frameworks where we're just knocking out some YAML, maybe it's HCL, and getting a job done. Because if we have to move to the left and get closer to those REST APIs, the complexity and the skill set needed kind of starts building up and might be a bit more than we want to take on. Unfortunately, the challenge with that is, is that those automation frameworks are not 100% feature complete in most cases. Um, maybe they're 90% complete, maybe they're not. Um, but in a lot of cases, especially in mind, you know, they, they tackle the day-to-day -day kinds of things, but then you're left with hitting the REST API uh, for the more custom things that you want to do. And the reason for that's very clear and, and reasons, you know, that, that occur going forward with, in my case, which are you start building up. Somebody's got to do this SDK work. Somebody's got to do these libraries, right? And so somebody's got to build that work on top of the product or services API, and that just takes time. And sometimes it's not important to the people doing the development, sometimes it is. And we're left with building our own thing. And eventually, as in my case, I have started doing one-offs enough that I started repeating myself. A lot of the common code for one script I was using to do like connection information and things like that in another script. And so there's a lot of cut and pasting going on. So I really wanted uh, an SDK or a library around the product I was using. Unfortunately, it didn't exist. Uh, I did some lurking, look, looking, of course, and did some searching. It wasn't there. So now I'm left to asking myself the question, what do I want to do about this situation? And since you're here, the answer is, I wanted to tackle that situation head on. And when you do that, you always have to ask yourself, what do I want to build, right? Uh, and before you even go there, you wanna think about how you want to build it, right? And so I've been in the DevNet community for quite some time, uh, both as a customer as, as well as a Cisco employee. And so the user experience focus on, on scripting, software development really resonates with me. So I really wanted to take that focus when I was working on this project. 
Now, the great news is kind of a quick little summary is that when I did that, it helped me make some key decisions very early on that made everything just kind of naturally fall out um, or lay out, I should say. Right. And so I could very easily structure the software, choose different technologies based on the user experience I was focusing on. And kind of more importantly, in my mind, I didn't have to decide everything up front. I had these high level goals and this high level user experience and, and they got more specific as I, as I went on, of course, but by focusing on experience and goals, I didn't have to plan this thing end to end. So I could take this more in a sprint like approach as opposed to say a waterfall like approach. Now, the last thing I'll mention before I actually dive into this is that language really matters here um, because what you have to realize at the end of the day is this is going to be a labor of love. This is going to be something you want to do. And if you start laying out all these requirements and all these milestones and all the kind of formal software development things ahead of time, you know, it's going to start feeling like your day job. And let's be clear, this is a labor of love. It's not really part of the day job. Um, I'm a TSA, technical solutions architect. I'm not a software developer. And so we want to make sure that when we want to take a break and when we want to enjoy something that that language, that mindset is in place so that you want to go back to it and it's not just another burden like the six or seven or 10 day jobs you've already got. Right. All right, with that, um, so that's my mantra. You know, that's why I focused on user experience and how I approached it psychologically and mentally. So now let's talk about exactly what I was gonna build, right? Um, in this particular case, I'm wanting to automate demo environments, right? I do a lot of demos with this particular product. I'll leave it generic because I really wanted this to be a generic talk. I didn't want to focus on the particular product I was focusing on. But in this case, I set them up, I set these demos up quite a lot. And a lot of times it's a common uh, environment and sometimes it's a specific one-offs. And so that was a key goal and uh, being able to script it was very important to me as well. So command line focus as well. Uh, and then since there's these gaps in Ansible and in Terraform, I really wanted to be able to try and leverage this later uh, in those projects. So try and keep that in mind that I didn't want to box myself in and have to redo a lot of work late. All right, so those are the high level goals. Now let's start talking about the user experience, right? And so I really want, you know, I need to start with how I'm going to consume this tool, right? And so, like I said, I was going to build a cuddle style command. And in this case, I'm calling it for this talk, util cuddle, rolls off the tongue, sort of. And, and so it's going to be structured a little bit more like the Linux variants of these tools. So like IP adder show, IP adder add, that sort of thing. Um, and less like kubectl. So, so, so we're going to have the command, a resource, any sub actions that those resources may have as, or subcategories and then actions and so forth. And what that looks like from a command line perspective is here on the screen, right? And so again, util cuddle switch add, since I'm doing network engineering, I'm going to add a switch to a particular fabric. That switch has a role and that switch is gonna have a name. And you can see here in the output, uh, which required what are options. And the cool thing about the technology I ended up uh, choosing for this particular project, all of this was generated for me. I didn't have to format any text. So again, technology choices matter. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is uh, when we're focusing on this end user experience and the goals from that perspective is what we're going to do and more importantly, what we're not gonna do. This particular product has uh, templates and, and instantiations of those templates as a core foundation to it. And so they vary greatly. They don't have the same set of requirements for each template. And so I didn't want to have to reproduce all the different variables that could go into a particular template. So we're definitely not going to do that. We're going to focus on actions that are very typical in the GUI. So I'm trying to replicate my demo setup. I can do that in my sleep with a mouse and a web interface. Now I want to do that in my sleep with a command line. And with those kind of high level requirements, you know, Python is a batteries included type language. So we've got 
a couple modules out there that allow us to do that. And I chose Typer in this case, uh, in this case since I uh, previously, if you use Click, I found Typer as I was doing my research uh, into other types of modules just to kind of have a complete picture, and I found it to be a bit easier to consume. And then the last bullet point is very important with those templates. Those templates do have default values that are encoded in them. So if I don't explicitly specify it, I'm going to leverage those going forward. Now that's kind of the outward looking user experience view. Um, what I found is when I was writing that CLI layer, which I'll also loosely call a UI layer, right? As I was asking questions about, okay, how do I want to structure this? Um, I realized I was looking inward to the software and asking what experience as the CLI developer I wanted to have with the underlying libraries and SDK. And so with that, I very much focused on having a user experience as the CLI developer. And so some requirements I, I uh, came across, I developed was along the lines of, you know, in order to keep that separation that that flexibility to be able to reuse this code later i really didn't need to have the workflow of the particular product embedded in with each command and so the next slide will kind of give you an idea of what i mean so this is the code for you to cuddle switch at our list in this case so you to cuddle switch list and in that, I'm just going to call the underlying library to say, hey, for this fabric and this switch name, give me a list, right? And then return back, uh, you know, a list of switches and, with, and some data with it. The alternative would have been to embed all the workflow for the APIs in order to get that list of switches. So I'd have to create a connection. I'd have to authenticate. I'd have to make sure uh, all the inputs are validated and so forth. But if I do that, I'm now interdependent with the API and its libraries and its calls and the CLI. And so now if I wanted to do say a web front end to this or an Ansible front end to this, I'm now having to cut and paste and having to reuse that logic. So in doing that, you know, it made it very clear that I needed some logical tasks in the library as, as laid out here, as well as clearly separating that that logic into an application library um, and then what was kind of interesting as i was thinking through it was this final goal which is to return the python or return my results as a python native data type again i don't want this the ui layer to be so inter interconnected with the underlying library that i'm passing you know, knowledge of the script object for or sorry the switch object as opposed to just passing it a Python dictionary. Now, of course, I have to coordinate what data I'm getting back. I have to understand what I'm getting returned. So there's some documentation and some standard standards I have to keep in mind when I write these methods. But again, it's not interconnected with the underlying library. All right, so that's the perspective from the CLI. That's the requirements or the goals, the experience I'm imposing upon the library itself. Now it's the library developer turn. I turn my hat, put on the library developer hat and say, okay, well, I'm gonna develop this logical list of methods and, and, and data types and, and classes and so forth. What do I need from the API that I'll be calling? Um, first and foremost, obviously I'm doing this in Python because I'm a Python person. Um, but on top of that, I do know that uh, the API does evolve a little bit. It's not as formal as some other APIs for this particular product. And there was a big product version jump coming soon uh, here in October. So I wanted to embrace for that impact, so to speak. So I wanted to make sure I did something to keep my API version independence. And so what that looks like here is uh, the requirements from the CLI developer side. You know, I've got a logical method here add switch in the switch resource. And here's that workflow for the APIs. And so you can see in this example, all I'm showing right now is to create the session. Um, in other steps of this, I'll define out what the APIs are, but I documented here what that workflow looks like. Make sure the fabric is valid, role is valid and so forth. And then a reminder, of course, to return a Python results data structure. 
so as I was thinking through what those library goals are, uh, you know, these sorts of things fell out. But more importantly, I talked about how templates are kind of foundational to this particular product. And since a lot of the resources are configured by templates instead of, say, a REST API resource endpoint, um, I would have to develop, and I did uh, develop a lot of objects uh, and classes around these templates and, and how to abstract that away. So you know, thinking software development, a lot of polymorphism and, and things like that that came into play. And it also suggested uh, a directory layout for the APIs, just as in the other sets of requirements. Um, and since the only real way to determine what the version of the API is, is through a connection, the connection actually has to talk to the server and, and figure that out. You know, that, that kind of put this goal of finding a way to let the connection session do the API queries. All right. Now, finally, you know, I've, I've looked at all these three aspects and now the SDK is, is, is front and center. What sort of experiences do I want to have with an SDK? <laughs> and this is, this is where you go, oh man, there are so many API endpoints, right? And surely there has to be a better way. And there is some potential good news on that front. Um, this product actually had an open API based um, spec uh, that generated its API. So that means since it's standards based, it's using a spec that is standards based. Um, there are some tools in the open API community uh, to auto generate an SDK. Um, there are some challenges with that. I've listed some of them here, uh, such as, you know, they generate the SDK based on templates of their own. Um, so you're trusting to some extent that all the code they're generating is secure, valid, you know, actually function and that sort of thing. Um, so you still have to do your due diligence. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, and then also, all it does is represent the API and the models within it. It doesn't tell you how to consume the API, that workflow of I need to connect, I need to generate a token, I need to then do X, Y, and Z. It still doesn't mitigate some of those underlying things that you have to know. Um, now, ultimately, uh, these are a bunch of negatives. Uh, the good news is it does generate the whole SDK. So don't get me wrong, but ultimately for me and this particular project, that templating aspect I've been mentioning throughout this talk is the key thing that drove me to write my own um, because that templating logic is just not defined in the open API spec. And so I ended up, to, you know, here's a, a list of, you know, a sample class, for example, uh, that I would use to generate the, the, the calls that you would make into the API in order to get the data out, right? Um, now the good news is, is that API does change, but it doesn't change radically. Right. And so what I was uh, capable of doing, given those, you know, slight tweaks here and there is to really define all of my work for the API into a core class. Right. And then whenever a version specific issue came up, I would break that out into the version specific uh, classes. Right. And then one, one thought I had from a previous layer of this user experience was that I may need to abstract out the API even further, but it turns out I didn't have to. So that was a good thing as I was looking down that, you know, I identified a potential issue, but the user experience clearly drove me uh, in a different direction. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of object oriented um, functionality in what I ended up developing. Now to wrap it all up, the one key takeaway, well, ah, okay, there's three. It's always three, right? So the three key takeaways is that keep in mind that it doesn't have to be overwhelming. You don't have to figure it all out on day one. And if you just look at it from this user perspective, right, this user experience perspective, it can really make a lot of decisions for you and, and guide you along the way. Because at the end of the day, you do have to enjoy this project and enjoy what you do and because and, it will be a labor of work. Now, in the slides that you'll get with this section, you know, there's some references back here. Uh, there's a GitHub repo with the code that, you know, I built out each one of those four uh, experience 
blocks into different phases in this repo. So you have access to that to kind of see how it evolved and then links to some of the technology I talked about in this session. And with that, I want to thank you so much for joining me in this session. I hope DevNet Create is, is going well for you. This is the last session of my day here. Uh, and look forward to a session tomorrow about how to actually package this all up into a Python module. So very interesting talk um, by another author.